Hi camera fans, it is Michael from Fujifilm again. I have my mirrorless X-T4 camera and my XF 100-400mm to lens and I'm just waiting for it to get dark enough to go outside and grab some great images of the moon. And that is partly what this episode's topic is all about. Astrophotography. And it's going to take a slightly different format in that it won't be me talking for the most part, but it's going to be a sit-down interview with a bona fide astrophotography expert. And he will tell you that um, this and much less is all anybody needs to get really great night sky images. All right, let's get to that interview. So, Ian, if I understand correctly, you spent uh, many years working for the world's largest telescope dealer. Is that correct? Um, after I graduated with a degree in astrophysics, I worked there for a number of years. Uh, and now I work for myself doing workshops, uh, night sky tours and stargazing tours. And I do astrophotography full time. That's awesome. Um, so tell us about some of your work and tell us about really what astrophotography is all about. Well, a lot of people think astrophotography is this bizarre world with these massive observatories and huge telescopes and research scientists. And, and the Hubble telescope is a prime example of what people think when they hear the term astrophotography. But there's another side of astrophotography that many people might not realize is available to them with a camera, a lens, and a tripod. Um, with technology uh, that we have today, we can take incredible inspirational night sky photos of things like the Milky Way, constellations, and even with the right equipment, you can do deep sky stuff on par and similar to the Hubble telescope. What can the average person with just a simple camera and a lens do? Well, first of all, one of the easiest things you can shoot, no matter where you're from, is the moon. Uh, you can get incredible detailed shots of the moon with a, a long focal length uh, camera lens. And the compositions you can get with it, with it are awesome. So that's one of the easiest things you can do uh, starting out with astrophotography, and we call that lunar photography. What kind of focal lengths tend to work best? So let's say we're dealing with the Fujifilm X-Series cameras, which are an APS-C size sensor. Um, what focal length would you recommend for moon shots? Well, one of my favorite lenses that I use to shoot the moon with is the 55 to 200 lens. And is there a particular end of that lens that you like, the wider side or the longer side? Or does it matter? Does it vary? Uh, I like the longer side just because I really like getting those crisp, clean close-up shots of the moon, but either side of it works. Uh, it's all part of the creative process and the freedom that everyone gets to just choose whatever they want. So the moon is actually pretty bright, especially when it's full, right? Most people don't realize that. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Full moon is bright and it can be tough to shoot, but one technique you can use is, it's called bracketing. Uh, and I, I'm sure a lot of photographers are familiar with that. Um, and a lot of moon shots that people see online are bracketed photos. They turn out great and it's super, super fun to shoot the moon over cities, over mountaintops, really just any composition you want with the moon. All right, so with a 200 millimeter lens, we've got the Earth that's rotating, you have the moon that's revolving around the Earth. So we've got a fairly narrow angle of view. That means our subject, the moon, is crossing across the frame kind of quickly, right? Mm -hmm. How do you solve for that? Uh, so I shoot really, really fast exposures, and then I bracket them. So I have uh, three shots all when I hit the shutter. So it's an exposure bracket, over and under. You got it. Ah, and then you're com uh, compositing them together. Mm -hmm. Is there a rule of thumb? Let's just talk about the moon for a minute. Was there a rule of thumb of how much over, how much under? As it depends on the sky conditions, right? It could be a little bit darker with your, um, with your composition. Other times it could be a little bit lighter. Maybe it's blue hour with the moon rising or something like that. So just kind of season to taste and, and test it out before you, uh, you take the, the final shot. So you're taking these then, you're compositing them as an almost like an HDR technique, and a tone mapping technique? You got it. Okay. Exposure time, what are we talking, a 500th of a second, a thousandth, or what? Yeah, one, uh, one twenty-fifth, or, oh. um, yeah, I mean, you can get up to one one-thousandth. Um, really just depends on your F ratio, which usually like F8 to F11 is a good number for me. Now that's really interesting, see, because I would think, most people would think you're shooting nighttime, it's dark, quote unquote, 
uh, we want to shoot wide open. F8, F11, that's not an answer I expected. The moon's really, really bright, especially when it's full. <laughs> um, and about what ISO are you typically at? That's a good question. 200, 400, again, just depends on the uh, composition and the time of day or night, I should say. So no special equipment necessary then. All of our X-Series cameras can do that, or basically any camera on the market can handle that. So, um, yeah. Uh, what else do you want to talk about? One of my favorite forms of astrophotography is Milky Way photography. Now, a lot of people have probably seen night sky Milky Way photos on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and I love it so much because one, it's very challenging, but anyone can do it. And when you know what you're doing, it's actually very, very simple. Okay, so do you wanna give us some of those tips to uh, how to handle the trickeries with the Milky Way? Of course. Well, first things first, let's talk about gear. Right. And again, all you need is a camera, a lens, and a tripod, right? Now, I choose Fujifilm cameras because of the X-Trans sensor. And what's special about it is it actually lets in a specific wavelength that's very important to astrophotographers called the hydrogen alpha wavelength. And it's prominent all throughout the night sky, especially in the core of the Milky Way, which is what we astrophotographers really go after. And so with that in mind, using the Fujifilm X-Trans sensor, it lets me get as much detail and rich color as possible when I'm doing Milky Way photography. All right, so hydrogen alpha, okay, very, very important for rendering <clears throat> the colors, right? Is that what it's all about? So it's a specific wavelength that uh, a lot of other cameras uh, don't allow much in when it comes into the sensor, but the X-Trans sensor al actually allows more transmission of that specific wavelength, which is abundant in the core of the Milky Way, allowing for more detail and rich color. We're talking just getting it right in camera without having to do any additional color manipulation and post-processing. Yeah, no filters yeah. needed, no camera mods needed, just your stock Fujifilm X-Series camera, you're good to go shooting the Milky Way. When we want to get the Milky Way, now, are we talking the entire sky? So are we talking about a really, really wide angle lens, or are we talking about a narrow band of what's out there? Uh, that's a great question, which leads me into the next part. We talked about the gear, right? You need the camera, the Fujifilm cameras, which I love. Now you need a wide angle lens for getting the Milky Way. And the reason is because the Milky Way is, well, it's really big um, and it's wide. And using a wide angle lens allows you to take longer exposures because the Earth is moving. And since the Earth is rotating, it appears as the stars move across the night sky. And so if you take a long exposure, which is required for uh, Milky Way photography, then you're gonna get what's called star trails, which you don't want. Stars are pinpoints of light and we wanna represent them as so. So um, we wanna make sure that we do long exposures before we start to see those streaks. Obviously we've seen the photographs, we've seen a lot of time lapses of the sky rotating right around a camera, which are very dramatic and interesting. And also we've seen, the, uh, we've seen people do intentional star trails. Um, but you're saying that we don't want the star trails Predominantly, we want to just get it short enough to where we're getting dots of light and not streaks, right? That's right. What's kind of an exposure formula are we looking at for that? So the name of the game for Milky Way photography is light gathering power. And we want to, like you were saying, get as much light in as possible in the shortest amount of time. And it does depend on your focal length of the lens you're using. So let's take, for example, you're using a 16 millimeter f1.4 lens. Well, with that, you can take about a 15 second exposure before you start to see really, really significant star trails. Oh, that long. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you will see star trails no matter what you do. However, um, you, it's okay to have minor, minor star trails because when you look at the overall picture, it might still look like those are pinpoints of light. It really is that, um, you know, season to taste mentality where how much star trail do you want to allow in your shot before you're satisfied, right? So let's take that uh, 16 millimeter lens example. 
Um, sometimes you do that 15 second shot and you don't like those star trails in there. It's still too much for you. Well, you just drop the exposure time down. However, you might say, maybe I can go a little bit longer and you're willing to accept just a tiny bit of star trailing. Then you bump it up to 20 seconds and you know, some people might like that as well. So with the moon, you were talking about an ISO of 100 or 200, I think you said, but now when we're talking Milky Way, what ISO level are we at usually? With Milky Way photography, ISO 1600 is where I like to start out with. And from there, you can either bump it up or bump it down, depending on your conditions. So 1600 with the 16 mil XF 16 millimeter 1.4 lens, are you shooting that wide open at 1.4? I'm shooting wide open at 1.4, because again, the name of the game is light gathering power. You want to get as much light in as possible because these things are so dim. The more light in, the better, especially with the, sh the uh, long exposures that we have to take but they can't be too long. Okay, and so people are going, ooh, a 1.4 lens, that means shallow depth of field, but you're talking about something that's light years away, so Technically, we, it's we at don't, infinity, It's right? at infinity, right? <laughs> so, so do you actually set the lens manually at infinity or you use autofocus? I set it to infinity, so okay. all settings I use are set to manual. All right, so uh, wide angle lens, really, really good for the Milky Way. Does that pose a problem for the thousands and thousands of people out there who want to get into this who don't live out in the middle of the desert, who live close to a city or in a suburb or something like that and have to deal with light pollution. Yeah, so the um, Milky Way is really only visible to people who are outside of the city. However, there are places all over the country where you can see the Milky Way, even with your naked eye. Um, so people, for example, who live in LA, they only have to drive about one to two hours to be able to photograph the Milky Way. And some people even like having that tiny bit of glow from the city light because it makes the horizon kind of stand out more or pop. In terms of getting our images and bringing them into the computer, do we have to think about any kind of processing or... Um... You know, are you pretty much happy with what you get right out of camera? And do you shoot RAW files or do you shoot the JPEGs? What recommendations can you give? I always, always shoot RAW. Okay. RAW is the way to go with these files because there's so much data that's stored on your sensor uh, and on the SD card. With RAW, you can stretch the files to really bring out those details that are hidden within the Milky Way. And just some simple Lightroom edits will make these photos pop. Do you tend to uh, add saturation or pull it back? Usually what I do is I'll do a, uh, some additional saturation, just a little bit, not too much over the top on uh, the core of the Milky Way, just to really make it pop and just give it that wow factor. Because really, I, I love that it makes people feel inspired to go out and photograph it for themselves. I mean, all all the creativity that goes into not just taking the photos and the compositions, but also the post-processing. It's part of the fun and just really makes it so when you see your own photo, it's almost like you inspire yourself as well as other people. Uh, what about noise reduction? I mean, you said 1600. I know with our cameras, they're pretty clean at that level. So do you find that that's a concern or? Noise reduction, I most of the time have to do very, very minimal noise reduction. Um, you know, again, in let's say Lightroom, you barely need to touch the noise reduction slider. Sometimes you don't need to at all. Having complete control over the image allows you to have complete creativity over the image too, which is what I love about astrophotography. All right, thanks a lot, Ian. Wow, that was very, very helpful. Now, I'm hoping that most of you noticed in the title to the episode, it said part one. There is going to be a second part, an extended version of my interview with our expert, who's going to talk about getting into the deep sky. All right, so be on the lookout for that episode coming out soon, and I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.